Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, if you all just fall asleep quickly, I'll blame it on a full tummy. I won't, uh, I won't take any offense to that. Um, but I do thank you for this opportunity to be able to share a perspective of the Word of God that most don't see and, and so many need to see. And that uh, as preterists, we are not afraid to search the Word of God. We are bold enough to open up our Bibles to look at the words that are in here that our God has passed down to us and to see what they say. Not what man says, not what a teacher said years ago or a doctrine that was established through the centuries, but rather today. What does this say to us as well as what it said to those who read these letters for the first time? Let me start by saying that in my lifetime, in my experience, it was back in about 1990 when I was working at the time, a fellow that I worked with had just gone through an evangelism explosion workshop and he was very excited to try it out. So that night as we were working side by side, he said to me, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? And of course, being the good person that I was, I said, heaven. And he kind of was like, well, what makes you say that? And I said, well, I am a good person. I've never committed any of the major sins that we see out there that so many others have done that God would see me in a favorable light. And these merit points that I've been accumulating will, of course, allow me into heaven. And he said to me, that is not what gets you into heaven. That is not what brings you into God's kingdom. It is strictly by faith in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and believing and trusting and clinging to that and that alone. It is by grace that we are saved and not on our own merits, not on our own standing, understanding, but rather what Jesus Christ has done for us. So that night, as I was trying to understand and comprehend the things that were going on because believe me there was major changes going on the reality of what Christ had done thousands of years before had affected my life in 1990 this is something that uh, really struck me it wasn't what I have done but it was what he has done and that in that gift of this knowledge it occurred that I was born again or born from above. Something had changed. Not that I could put my finger directly on it, but something inexplicitly had changed. This night, a truly supernatural act had taken place. I had understood for the first time and I had heard the message a million times. As a matter of fact, I'd walked the aisle a couple of times giving my life to Christ. I think we even, my wife and I got rebirth certificates uh, before this, this night. But yet, that one night, the effectual call of God's into my life took place. I understood that it was Him that secured my relationship. Now, I just want to ask this audience, if what I am talking about is something that you can relate to, or am I the only one that has ever experienced this? I take that some of you can and relate to this. Amen. Well, having to know then what that experience is like, you know that this is something that comes from above. It is nothing that we work for, nothing that changes us in what we do, but it is what Jesus Christ has done for us. It is just as real to us as being in this particular church on this particular day. It is as real to us as the person sitting next to us. Knowing that this supernatural act has taken place in our life is something that we will take to our graves undeniably. We'd have to say, even to that last breath, Jesus Christ saved me and he alone has held me in his care. It is, it is something that we read in John chapter 3 about being born again. And then with this new birth, 
this birth from above that changes our lives. Everything in regards to God's word comes alive to us. You pick up the Bible before this event takes place and you say, okay, it's filled with good stories. I can gain a lot of moral uh, teachings from it. But yet, when you pick this book up, after that change, after that supernatural act, that act that can't be denied, but yet you can't present it to others in a specific way, the words of this book become alive and real. They draw you in, they give you a hunger to know and understand it more. There's no physical proof of this supernatural event of this birth. You know, it's, it's funny, when you, when you go for a marriage license or a, a, birth, uh, a passport or any sort of official document, you need to have your birth certificate with you. Standing there right before people, the, the person at the window and saying, yes, I need a, a passport, isn't proof enough that you were born. Who knows where you might have come from, but you need that proof to prove, prove that you were born. Well, with us, we don't have a particular document. We don't have something tangible. We don't have something physical that we can present to the world and say, this supernatural transformation has taken place in my life. Because when it comes to the workings of God, he works in these mysterious ways. He works through the supernatural, the spiritual things that he brings into our lives. This event is just as real to us as our natural physical birth, undeniably. In John's gospel, he speaks of this kingdom that he brings us into. In John 3.3, 3, it says that you need to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. You need this new birth in order to enter into the kingdom of God. We don't need a physical birth certificate or a document to be able to show this. Because it continues to say that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The gospel, in John's gospel, it continues to talk about how God is spirit. And those who worship him need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Because that kingdom that we enter into, the kingdom that we can see once our eyes are open, is not one that is tangible, but it is real. And unfortunately, so many people that have not gone through this, that, have not, that don't understand what it means to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, they don't know about the God of the, the living God of the universe, the one who has created all. They say, because I can't see him, he does not exist. But we know he exists because he has awakened a supernatural spiritual part of us that draws us and brings us into a fellowship with him. This is similar to the questions that Nicodemus asked of Jesus that night. How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born can he? This is a dilemma that we find throughout the Bible. It began with the Israelites and it continues, unfortunately, even to today in the church. An ability to discern between which is physical and which is spiritual. When God called Adam into covenant, he brought him into the Garden of Eden. And it gave him a physical means by which he could have some sort of understanding of what it's like to have a relationship with this transcendent God whom he could not see. God used physical means to teach these spiritual uh, realities to Adam. God told Adam, there's two trees in the garden there in specific. One is the tree of life and the other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you cannot eat from. But you can eat from all the others. But the day in which you do eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Well, the question is, did Adam die that day? Did he drop to the ground? 
Did Eve need to dig a, a, a grave for him and bury him that day? Well, obviously, he continued to live many years after that. But he did die spiritually. He did die in, in that separation between him and God, a relationship so treasured, I'm sure, that he cared so much about after he had lost it. After he was separated from the presence of God and cast out of the garden, sent into a whole different area, abandoned and separated. It showed there the evidence, the spiritual truth of life and death. Adam had the life. He had abundant life in the garden in the fellowship with his God. But when he was separated and cast out, he understood what death truly was, what it means to be separated from God. And that is what he was trying to teach him through this. Physical garden, a physical law, all the things he needed to do. But the spiritual reality of it was that he died that day, and in the separation, he, he was cast out of the garden. And that it couldn't come waltzing back into the garden to eat of the tree of life. No, it requires God in order to restore that relationship. The nation of Israel can define life as God's face shining upon them. They knew that when they had God's favor, they felt alive. They, they knew that they were God's people and meant for a purpose. Yet when they rebelled and disobeyed God because of their sin, they would be cast away from him and, and, and removed from the land and, and, and God's back would be turned from on them. In the state of spiritual death, they knew they needed a resurrection. They wanted to be restored back into fellowship with God. They longed for that relationship that they, uh, that they had lost through their sins. Throughout the Old Testament, God uses many physical means and events to communicate a spiritual truth to his people. He used circumcision that was a physical sign of a spiritual covenant. Sacrifices were physical signs of, of uh, their attempts to be able to restore that spiritual relationship that was severed. A pillar of smoke by day and a fire by night was a physical sign of God's presence with his people. And the Torah was the physical requirements for Israel to make an attempt to keep that relationship with God. It gave them hope in that respect. Over and over again in the Bible, we learn that God's chosen people did not stay faithful to God. Rather, they would continually break their covenant with God. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 6, he begins it by talking of this glorious imagery of him standing before God. Truly a beautiful picture. But it continues where Isaiah is called into being a prophet. And God tells him, yes, I want you to be a prophet. I want you to go and tell my people what, what I have in store for them. But they will be blind. They will be deaf. They will not be able to understand. But I still need you to go out and talk to these people and give them the, the words. This message was incomprehensible to them because of this blindness and this deafness that God had put over them. There was a spiritual blind and deafness to what God had told them to understand God's plan and his, his methods. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, he tells, tells us that the Word became flesh, the Logos. The Logos and the Word, which is Jesus, was born of a virgin. For God so loved the world that he came to be a light unto Israel, who was still very much in the dark to the things of God. Jesus went around Israel, and in a very physical way, he would heal the deaf and the blind. But his mission on earth then was much greater than just being a physician healer amongst the people. These miracles that he had done were wonderful signs to them to see that he is truly the Messiah. But his true mission to Israel was to remove the spiritual blindness, to remove the spiritual deafness from his people so that they could see the kingdom that was being ushered in for them. During his ministry on earth, the Jews always seemed to want to look 
for a physical answer to their questions. Jesus always seemed to respond in spiritual answers instead. They, they, Jesus would talk to them in parables, which are um, earthly stories with a spiritual meaning. Especially when it came to understanding the kingdom of God. They longed for the physical. It seemed as though they wanted Jesus to take out a, a GPS system and say, yeah, this is where it is. But he would always speak to them in parables. And afterwards, as they kind of walked away scratching their heads, he would say, those who have eyes can see and those who have ears can hear. Jesus taught his disciples much of the realities and introduced them to this kingdom, uh, this kingdom of the new covenant that was being brought in. It was not going to be done, brought in with works or, or in a physical characteristics. Rather, it was going to be brought in through grace and a spiritual understanding of what God intended. We read in Mark's gospel from chapter 4, 10, 10 through 12, as soon as Jesus was alone, his followers, alone with the, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he said, was saying to them, To you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get, uh, get everything in parables, so that while seeing, they may see and not perceive, and while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might uh, return and be forgiven. Jesus came to reveal the mysteries of his kingdom. It had been hidden in the physical practices of Israel through the law, circumcision, the priesthood, sacrifices, the temple, and so on. Jesus came to earth to die for his elect, to restore man's relationship to God and to usher in his spiritual kingdom. Jesus re was revealing this mystery of the kingdom to those people who were born from above, whose eyes had been opened, whose ears had been opened to, to the spiritual nature of what he was speaking of. Then in John 3, 3, uh, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. S uh, simple enough to those of us who have been born from above. For that which is spirit is spirit. Well, the saddest aspect of Christianity and through the ages and even through today, that it is many who are believers, when it comes to understanding the mystery of the kingdom of God, have reverted back to being as those in the Old Testament days. Old Testament Israel and understanding everything in a physical way and in a physical kingdom. While the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt, they longed to be back in the land of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. With that first Passover, God, using Moses, leads his people out of Egypt into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land. They knew that God was with them the whole way. It was God that had made it possible for them to escape this slavery and bring them into this land. Yet, and through the tough times, or, or I should say, even when it got tough for them, though, they wanted to turn back. It is through these tough times that those who have the spiritual eyes and the spiritual ears know that God is still with them. They need to cling to what God has promised them through faith, not, not, not needing physical evidence of the spiritual truths. It was much easier for Israel to say, no, we want to go back to uh, Egypt. It was much more safer for us, though they were in bondage. But yet, once in the land, knowing that God had done all of this for them, they still cried out for a physical king. God was their king, but that was not good enough because he's not someone that you see sitting upon a throne. He is someone that you need to see with the spiritual eyes and to hear his words through spiritual ears. And they, they long for a physical king instead. So God gave them Saul, David, Solomon, 
That is until the, the kingdom split and then they were conquered by the Gentiles and they kind of uh, were ruled and, and over by the Gentiles from that time on. <clears throat> How can it be that, these pe the, that God's people could still reject God and still have disbelief though he had brought them so far and did all of these things for them? We look back and say, well, they must have been blind and they must have been deaf to what God had done for them. That the, that the words of God in Isaiah chapter 6 were true, that they had that veil before them. But the question is, what is our excuse today? Christians today seem to be making the same type of mistake, going back into the Old Testament looking for the physical, waiting and longing for a physical kingdom, and looking forward to a physical ruler who will sit upon a throne of this everlasting kingdom here on earth. Jesus clearly told his disciples uh, and us as we read his word, that his kingdom does not come with observation, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Luke chapter 17, 20 through 21. He, he even went on to say in Mark's gospel, 9, 1, Assuredly, I say to you that some standing here who, who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God pre, pre, present with power. Jesus was telling his first century audience, those first Christians, that during their lifetime, this kingdom is to come and that they will be brought into it. And if the kingdom of God was present at that time, it certainly is today. And that those Christians who long for the physical are missing out on the true blessings of what God intended through the spiritual. We should not be looking forward to some earthly kingdom, some kingdom that comes down from heaven on a destroyed planet and, and can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. But the scriptures are clear that Jesus came in the flesh to die for us on the cross and that with that, he would restore the eternal uh, relationship and bring us into an everlasting life. Nowhere does it say that he's coming back to earth to set up a physical kingdom. He teaches us that his kingdom is spiritual and God is spirit. And his spiritual kingdom is being ushered in in that first century and is today. The church was formed on that first day in Pentecost with the outpouring of the spirit unto all flesh. This loving act of God brought 3,000 into the church that day. The church that we call the body of Christ. Paul in Ephesians 1 tells us exactly where we as believers need to be located. Not in a physical land, but rather in a spiritual kingdom which is already present, which is already with us. It is in our midst. It had been brought in by Jesus in that first century. Paul tells us that we need to be in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 tells us that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he used, uh, chose us in him. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he has lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will. In verse 13, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, uh, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul is very, very clear in teaching us that there is an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus likened the Holy Spirit to the wind back in John 3. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is also one born of the Spirit. No one sees the wind, but we do see the effect. No one sees the Holy Spirit, but we do see the effect. It can't be seen in physical terms, uh, 
when it happens, but we certainly know it happens because it places us in Christ. As Adam was placed in the garden, as Israel was placed in the land, we are placed in Christ. I think it's fair to say that anyone who claims to be a Christian First and foremost, rather than saying, I'm in a Baptist church, I'm in a Lutheran church, I'm in a Catholic church, I'm in Christ. Uh, Pastor Mike mentioned last night about how we went to, uh, several of us fellows went to this conference a week or so ago on, uh, on counseling through grief and death and such. And it was, it was good. There was people from all different denominations, and so many of them, they went around the room, oh, we have 10 Lutherans, we have six Episcopalians, and, and what hurt was, you're fracturing the body. We are here because of Jesus Christ. We are in his kingdom. We are his people, his children. We are not a particular denomination's label. We are in Christ. John tells us the, that the Word became flesh. I would say yes, definitely, that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem that day, that the Word became flesh. But I also submit to you that the Word remains flesh even today. The Word is alive and well within each and every believer. Jesus Christ dwells in tabernacles with each and every one of his people. And in our flesh, we carry forth his word. His word, which his flesh, the body, the church, continues today. The scriptures tell us that it won't see decay, but sometimes I wonder. This is where we need to understand our position in the body of Christ, amongst the believers. When David wrote in Psalm 16, 8 through 11, he knew that God was with him always. David certainly dwelled out in the, the fields with his sheep and in the, in the wilderness, but he knew that he was not abandoned out there, that his God was his rock and his fortress, and his, 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 and his presence was always with him. Through the church today, the believers are the body of Christ here on earth. We are Christ's representatives. We should be manifesting the words that God had given us through sharing the gospel. By grace, through faith, you have brought into Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body and the whole chapter speaks of a body. And it talks about how it has many members, but all those members need to come together to function as one body. This is a very supernatural, spiritual type of thing that God is getting across to us. That if we contend that this body that's spoken of, the church, needs to be a physical manifestation of a body, we are blinded to the spiritual things, the spiritual truths that God gives us. We need to open up our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears and see that this body is us. That we are part of it. We maintain the word of God within us. We are carrying it with us. We, his, his body is here. That the many members have different, different um, purposes, but yet all for one goal, to bring glory to Jesus Christ, to our God. Ephesians 4.11 states that God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up the body of Christ. We need to all be working together in unity to build on this body that God had given us as his ambassadors, spreading the gospel bringing those who are lost, separated from God, into fellowship and into communion with God. They might hesitate if they know that having fellowship with us as well. Sometimes we don't present ourselves as well as we should. But to understand that to have that relationship with God is the best. Yet it is amazing how so many that claim to be in Christ and in the body, the church, can war against one another. 
from the, ver from the starting point of being born again. We can each go to our own churches. We can learn that particular church's teachings. And most churches still teach that some of God's spiritual promises must be in physical form, otherwise they're not fulfilled, while other churches may proclaim they have been fulfilled and fulfilled in a spiritual way that we can see and rejoice in, that we can spread the good news. These differences can, can be there, not necessarily to divide, but give us purpose to fellowship, give us purpose to study the Word of God. If it were so easy, Paul had a thorn in his side, and he asked for it to be removed. If we said, God, remove all the futurists that are thorns in our side, it, it wouldn't give us purpose to study. It wouldn't bring us into closer fellowship with God. It would, it, we wouldn't have to have the trust and the faith in Him that we do. Paul gives us a lesson of the body, that, what it is like throughout chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. The whole chapter is speaking about this body. It is not talking about a physical body, but rather a spiritual one. I think we can all agree that in a spiritual sense, those who are in Christ form that body here on earth, the body of Christ, the church. Yet it is so sad to say that there is a cancer within that body. Here in America, we, we, we rather war with one another. We'd rather separate and turn our back because after all, and this is, this is the kicker, I can tell who's saved and who isn't. Oh, this individual sees a fulfilled hope. It's all been fulfilled. My goodness, it's not the same as what I've heard. He must not be a Christian. This person over here sees something different in another way. No, no, Christ needs to come back again. Well, I shouldn't have fellowship with them because they don't see it the same way we do. This cancer needs to be cut out and removed from the body of Christ. We have all been given different gifts. We've all been given different ways in order to minister. Brought together, we can be a mighty force. And it has been a mighty force throughout, throughout the ages. But it seems as though here in America today that we have started to, to, to wane. The body has lost its strength. We have been re, uh, acquiescing to everything else but what we need to be doing is standing strong for Jesus Christ. The different churches that are out there, we see the separation, unfortunately. We see that those, some, some of those who are, that are in Orthodox churches, because of their, they are in the Orthodox church because they are comfortable. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, my wife told me I should just stick to reading. And... and, and. <laughs> <laughs> She's right. Always is. <laughs> As a matter of fact, any, anything that makes sense that I say today is because of her. <sighs> um, what, I, what I was saying is God had given us his word that we can read it for ourselves. There are those who stand in certain churches that are, or, or, what, or what their teachings are called orthodox because they were founded by the, the fathers of the church and such. But who said that they were absolutely right? Why can't we have the freedom? After all, we do have a freedom in Christ to be able to open this book and see what it says, to learn from it and to grow with one another, to build one another up. Unfortunately, when there's, in some churches, when there's a challenge and there's a difference, they're either cast out, excommunicated, or held down and sold. Oh, brother, we don't, we don't talk about such things. What a shame. What a shame to the body. Others may say that they have the, only the right understanding. The only ones who can understand and, and have everything sealed up. Well, since I have all the answers, we don't need to be going into territory where they think something's different because then I might be challenged. And I might have to be actually able to explain my position. Have we not all come to Christ in one spirit with one teaching? We are all believers after all. Human beings are fallible, and we need to stand together to help grow and strengthen one another. 
After all, do you, do you think God, as our creator, doesn't know the differences that we as individuals have? Doesn't he bring us into his body for purposes that maybe we don't quite understand? There are some who go to a Pentecostal church because they enjoy the emotion of it. They have a feeling. Uh, um, last night or, or today when we were singing some of the songs, it was the most Pentecostal I've seen our church in a long time. We are the frozen chosen. And, and we do, but I seen hands up, there was rocking and, and it, it was cool. It was great because there needs to be emotion. It's an emotional thing when we talk about our God. He affects us so deeply. That's why I love Brother Glenn. Oh, man. Every time he speaks. But God knows these things. There's people who are drawn to the gospel and in Christ because of that emotion. We can't reject them. There are others who want more of a liturgical service because maybe in their personality they're more staid and formal and, and conservative in that respect. We can't reject them. We, as the body, need to understand these truths that God has brought us all in. It's different members, different functions, all for the same purpose of bringing him honor and glory. After all, is he not the head of the church? Should, church, uh, should believers from different churches cast out one another and just send each other away, even knowing that they are born again, we say, oh, brother, you may have had that experience, but because you don't have that same doctrine, it ain't so. You cannot be truly saved. It is Christ who knows, not us. There's, when I first came to learning many of the doctrines, we talk of the Calvinistic perspective with five points of Calvinism. And I've heard people say, well, if you don't believe in a limited atonement, oh, brother, you're not a Christian, because a true Christian holds to all five points. I'd sure love to see that verse in scripture. Uh, I, I'm still looking for it. I, I didn't even see Calvin's name in here. <laughs> There's so many things that we ridiculously fight over, that we argue about when we ought to be coming together. After all, is it not being in Christ that we have this abundant life? Is it not that God has placed us in Christ? Why would you want to leave it? Why would you say somebody else is out of it if they have truly faith in Jesus Christ? I've lost it. I don't know where I am. But, <laughs> thank you. But one of the points I'd like to make is, at, at, you know, here in America we do have it good and things are changing and that's an unfortunate uh, reality. And we see so much coming against the church. There's a, a, a baker who can't bake because he's being sued and lost his business. That whatever business you might be in, if you have a, have a different point of view than somebody else, you could lose everything. And it seems to be Christians that, they, that the world seems to want to go after. But if we stood strong, they could not do that. But yet, we'd rather be warring with one another in the vestibules and churches. Uh, just recently, a uh, fellow, Glenn Beck, most of you might have heard of him, he's a, he's a Mormon. He raised money, he went into Iraq, he took 140 or 149 Christians out of Iraq. He brought them to Slovakia because he could not bring them here. Our nation, which was supposed to be a Christian nation, rejects the Christians that are being persecuted in the Middle East. What a sad commentary on the church. Because it is the church that needs to stand strong. Children are being aborted. Things are going bad in our, in our society in regards to things that we ought to be standing up against. Standing strong with one another. Showing a force of determination. But rather... We'd rather say, oh, no, he's not a Christian. Oh, oh, Sister Susie wore a short dress. That, that, oh, she's not a Christian no more. We have diminished the body of Christ to a point where it is ineffectual here in America. 
But I do pray that throughout the rest of the world, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's uh, Asia or anywhere, where God would restore that body to a strong and healthy body. If it means that we need to come down, so be it. What I say to the church before that happens, stand strong, stand together. Come together as those who are glad, who rejoice and are happy to be in the body of Christ. As Paul writes, rejoice always. Again, I say to you, rejoice. If, the, if uh, there is no other place, no other heavenly place I'd rather be than in Christ. Um, my wife and I used to dance, ballroom dance, so this song means something to me because I have no sense of rhythm. And George, George Gershwin wrote a long time ago, I got rhythm, I got rhythm. Who could ask for anything more? Well, the body of Christ, the church here on earth, should be singing a song like, we are in Christ. We are in Christ. Who could ask for anything more? For those who have ears, let them hear. For those who have, excuse me, for those who have eyes, let them see. We do all have a spiritual blessing, the promises that God had given us. Praise our Lord and God that he is faithful, that he has given us all the promises that he had said so long ago and that today that we have those blessings and we can rest secure in our position in Christ and that we can be strong with one another if only we could take the blinders off our eyes and ears. Amen. Thank you.